Hi everyone, in this video we are going to investigate the motion of a particle which is dropped from rest and then falls under gravity and under the influence of a quadratic drag force, in other words a drag force which is proportional to the square of the particle's velocity. Now you may find it helpful to watch my previous video first in which we investigated the upwards motion of this same particle. So you can kind of imagine this video as being the second phase of the motion of a particle that's thrown upwards and then reaches a maximum height and now it's coming down again. So there'll probably be a few occasions throughout the video when I reference things that we talked about in the last video. Having said that, this video should stand uh, on its own and be understandable, even if you haven't seen the last one. So let's start working our way through this. What does our diagram show? Well, we've got a particle sitting at a y-coordinate of zero. We are going to, as usual, have our y-axis pointing upwards. So as soon as this particle starts to fall, it's going to have a negative y-coordinate. Um, I've also shown the two forces acting on the particle, mg, the weight acting downwards, where m is the mass of the particle, and b, y dot squared, is your drag force. y dot squared is the speed squared, because a dot represents a time derivative, and b is just the coefficient of proportionality. Um, I've also written down that u equals zero, meaning that the initial speed of the particle is zero. So we drop it from rest. So from this diagram, we have all the parameters we need. Uh, we can start by writing down Newton's second law and get an equation of motion, right? So your mass times acceleration is same as last time, m y double dot. Uh, this time, the difference is that the forces are pointing in different directions. So mg gets a minus sign it's pointing downwards in the negative y direction uh, while your drag force is pointing upwards in the positive y direction so that gets a plus b y dot squared now again this is a non-linear differential equation so we want to um, basically integrate it twice we first uh, treat it as a first order differential equation for y dot and then we integrate y dot later and find y so it's helpful to write the left hand side as m dy dot by dt, right? Just writing basically one of the dots uh, on the y as an explicit time derivative. Right hand side can say the same, right? minus mg plus by dot squared. And again, same as last time, it's separable. So we can get the y dots on one side and the t's on the other side. If we do that, we get m dy dot. Uh, I'm going to choose for convenience to write the denominator as mg minus b y dot squared. In other words, I divided by all of that stuff, but I also flipped the signs because it's going to make the integration easier um, when we come to integrate it. And that's going to leave us with minus dt on the right hand side, right? Because we flipped the signs. So you've got a minus sign. So this is mostly the same as what we had last time, but this minus sign in the denominator is going to make a big difference to our solution. So what I'm going to do next is factor out a b from the denominator of our fraction so that y dot squared has a coefficient of one. That's going to get us m over b, uh, dy dot over um, mg over b minus y dot squared on the left-hand side. I'm gonna define some derived parameters. I'm gonna define this thing called capital B squared to be mg over b so that we can just replace that whole group of parameters with v squared. The reason we called it v squared is because last time uh, we interpreted it as the terminal velocity of the particle. So have a look at the previous video if you'd like to see why that is. Um, we also define this other uh, derived parameter, which I called gamma, as b over m, which means that m over b is the same as one over gamma, right? Then we can integrate, this looks a little bit simpler, fewer parameters around, and the right-hand side is just minus the integral of dt. So here's where the main difference comes in. A trig substitution won't work because of the minus sign. Last time we substituted y as tan of theta or v tan of theta. This time it's going to have to be a hyperbolic trig function, right? There is um, a sort of general feature of hyperbolic trig identities that they look like ordinary trig identities but with some different signs uh, as in pluses and minuses. The last time we tried tan theta, why don't we try hyperbolic tan of theta this time? So let's let our variable y dot be equal to v times hyperbolic tan of theta, and we differentiate that to find dy dot. So dy dot is v um, hyperbolic sec squared of theta d theta, just quoting a standard derivative there. And as for the denominator of our integrand, well, what's that? v squared minus y dot squared. Again, when you square y dot, you're going to get a v squared from that. And so you can factor it out, v squared, into 1 minus hyperbolic tan squared of theta. Then you use your hyperbolic um, trig identity, remembering that cosh squared minus shine squared 
is equal to 1, you divide that whole thing by cosh squared and you find that 1 minus hyperbolic tan squared is hyperbolic sec squared. Um, so this is just equal to v hyperbolic sec squared of theta. Now this has worked nicely because, well, you'll see what happens when we sub all of that back into our integral. You've still got your 1 over gamma prefactor. The numerator is v hyperbolic sec squared theta d theta. Um, when you put that over the denominator, the sec squared hyperbolic sec squared bit is going to cancel and you're going to just be left with d theta over v because you've got v over v squared, right? So your integral is just integral of d theta over v and we integrate the right hand side we get minus t plus a constant which for now I'm just going to call capital T though the interpretation is different from what it was last time because there's no concept of a maximum height um, if the particle is just moving downwards. So you do the integral and because v is just a constant you get theta over v. Um, then from the definition of theta, theta is inverse hyperbolic tan of y dot over v. Um, you put all that together and the left hand side is going to just be 1 over gamma v times inverse hyperbolic tan of y dot over v. That's still equal to minus t plus big T. We just absorb our new constant of integration into big T. And then we can rearrange, multiply by gamma v and take the hyperbolic tan of both sides. And you conclude that y dot is v um, hyperbolic tan of gamma v big T minus little t, like that. As for boundary conditions, we said we drop the particle from rest. So we can say that y dot at time zero is just zero. That's basically, you know, I wrote u equals zero on the diagram. Um, now the left hand side, therefore, of the previous line becomes zero. Uh, you get on the right hand side simply v hyperbolic tan of gamma v big T. Um, but because hyperbolic tan of zero is zero, that implies that big T itself has to be zero, right? So you can say the constant of integration is actually zero and you end up um, with this nice simple expression. Uh, if, if T is zero, we can also use the fact that hyperbolic tan is an odd function um, to put this minus sign uh, in front of the, the hyperbolic tan, right? So you can write it as minus V hyperbolic tan um, of just gamma V T. This confirms what we said earlier that we expect you know, y to always be negative as soon as it starts moving. It's also interesting at this point to stop and think about the limiting case of this function when t goes to infinity. So at very large times when the particle has been falling for a long while, um, well hyperbolic tan of a very large number uh, approaches 1 and so y dot approaches minus v. Um, so you've got this constant limit to your velocity, constant sort of downwards velocity. Um, and we give that the name terminal velocity, which is consistent with what we said last time about you know, v being the terminal velocity. So that's quite nice to see. So we've got y dot as a function of time. All we have to do is integrate that with respect to time to find y itself. So to do that, we can use the fact that hyperbolic tan is shine over cosh. So we write this as minus the integral um, of v uh, shine of gamma vt over um, cosh of gamma vt, uh, integrating with respect to time. Now consider what you'd get if you differentiated the denominator, right? The derivative of cosh is shine, but because of the chain rule, you would get an extra factor of gamma v pulled out. So what that means is we have a case where the numerator is almost the derivative of the denominator, but there's an extra missing factor from the chain rule. Um, but when you have a case where the top is the derivative of the bottom, you get natural log of modulus of the bottom. Here, all we have to do is add an extra factor in of 1 over gamma v, sort of doing the reverse of the chain rule, right, to take account of the fact that you have a gamma v in front of the t, um, and then you get log of uh, cosh of gamma v t. I'm not even bothering to put the modular signs in here because for real numbers, uh, cosh is always positive. So the modulus doesn't do anything. Let's put a constant of integration in um, as well. We can fix the value of the constant of integration using our other initial condition, which is that the particle starts at a y coordinate of zero. So y of zero is zero. Um, that means all of that stuff has to equal zero. And for that to be the case, c has to be basically this underlined bit without the minus sign, right? So c is one over gamma because the v's cancel times ln of cosh of just zero because 
we're subbing in t equals zero. However, cosh of zero is one and log of one is zero. So c itself is zero. Um, so that's nice because we can then write down that y is just uh, minus one over gamma ln of cosh of gamma vt with no constant added. And if we want, we can then go back and sub in um, the original parameters in place of gamma and v. You're gonna find that it's minus m of v ln of cosh of uh, root gb over m times t. You can go through a couple of short exercises to confirm that this expression makes physical sense. For example, you can take uh, the limit um, when b goes to zero, you do a Taylor expansion and you find that you recover your um, half gt squared minus a half gt squared that you would get in the case of no damping, which is reassuring. And also you can note that when t is very large, when the particle has been falling for a long time, cosh grows approximately exponentially. Then you take the log of an exponential and you get a linear function. So y sort of decreases at a linear rate at large times, which is consistent with the idea that the velocity becomes constant at large times. So now that we've got our general y as a function of time, uh, I want to finish by making a connection between this video and the last video where we looked at the upwards motion. In particular, we are going to investigate whether it took our particle more time to reach its maximum height or more time to get back to the position where it started. So now that we've got our general y as a function of time, I'd like to finish by making a connection to the previous video uh, where we considered the upwards motion of the particle. In particular, I would like to investigate whether it took our particle more time to go from its starting point to its maximum height or more time to then come back from its maximum height to its starting point. Now, it might be interesting to just pause for a couple of seconds and have a think about whether you can make a prediction based on uh, some sort of simple physical argument and then we can check whether it's consistent with uh, what the maths tells us. So since we're investigating time taken, what I first want to do is take our expression for y and rearrange it to find t as a function of y rather than y as a function of t. So we can multiply both sides by um, minus b over m and exponentiate both sides and then do inverse hyperbolic cos to get rid of the cosh and then you're going to multiply by root of m over gb. So if we go through all of that, we are going to end up with um, t uh, as a function of y is going to be root of m over gb, inverse hyperbolic cos of e to the minus by divided by m. So I've just written down here one of the results that we derived in the last video, which is h. Uh, h is the maximum height that your particle would reach if you were to launch it upwards with an initial speed of u. Now this is relevant because we are interested now in the time taken to go from uh, the maximum height back down to where it would have started originally. So if we were to rephrase this in the language of this video, um, you would say that the y coordinate that we're interested in is minus that stuff, right? Because we defined y to start at the maximum height. So you need that minus sign because uh, your particle is moving downwards. Um, so we want to basically substitute that into the expression for t that we had in the previous line. Um, in fact, the argument of the inverse hyperbolic cos is e to the minus by over m. And we can get that quite nicely from uh, the expression that we had in the last video, right? This rearranges to e to the minus uh, by over m, just by exponentiating to get rid of that log, um, is equal to sec of inverse tan of uh, u root b over mg. Then we can sub that as the argument of the inverse hyperbolic cos. So we're going to get a pretty horrible looking expression. I'm going to call this capital T down just to make it clear what this is. So it's time to go from the maximum height to the original starting point when it was launched upwards. Um, you've still got your prefactor of root m over gb. You've still got your inverse hyperbolic cos. Then the argument of the inverse hyperbolic cos is basically going to be all of the previous lines. So I could just um, copy that and put that in there. So inverse hyperbolic cos of sec of inverse tan of all of that stuff. This is an expression for the time to go downwards. And what I've just put below our t down is the expression for the time taken to go from the initial position up to the maximum height during the upwards part of the motion. That's come directly uh, from the previous video. Now it's certainly not obvious to me at least just by looking at these expressions which one is bigger but one way to approach this would be to note that the inverse tans appearing in both expressions have the same argument. So you could call that whole inverse tan bin uh, some letter of its own. Let's just call it capital X. Then we can say that t down 
uh, is proportional to inverse hyperbolic cos of sec of capital X, while T up is simply proportional to X itself. Now, if you do a Taylor expansion of inverse hyperbolic cos of sec of something, you find that it's proportional to uh, X plus the next highest order term is X cubed divided by six, which means that this is going to be bigger than this, right? It's not that much bigger um, when X is very small, which makes sense, right? Because when X is small, that means B is small. There's no damping and there's symmetry between the upwards and downwards motion. So when your B is small, you would expect the times taken to be very similar. However, the bigger B gets, the bigger X also gets, and the longer the downwards motion takes compared with the upwards motion. It is possible to come to the same conclusion in a much less quantitative way. For example, you can argue that um, because there's a dissipative force of air resistance acting on a particle, it's constantly losing energy. So at any given um, height on the way down, the particle always has less kinetic energy and therefore less velocity than it did at the same position on the way up. So it's going to take longer for the downwards part of the motion. Anyway, I think that's enough for this video. Hope it's been interesting and I'll see you soon.